Welcome all of you to the fourth class session in the Walter Callas Jazz Series, featuring Scott Wilson, who is director of U.S. Jazz Studies Program. For his presentation today, Scott is going to be joined by one of his new faculty colleagues, Dr. Jose Valentino. Jose is a Sony music recording artist and an internationally acclaimed instrumentalist, composer, and educator. Is well known for his excellent performances and versatility on the flute, saxophone, bass, piano, and Latin percussion. Jose has the distinction of being the winner of a Grammy Award, an Emmy Award, a Global Music Award, a Parents' Choice Award, and he holds the record for being a 52 time Downbeat Music Award winner, and the list goes on and on. Jose has earned a bachelor's degree in music theory, a master's in instrumental performance, a doctor of ministry and global outreach, and a PhD in music education. As a professor in our School of Music, Jose serves as director of the Music Business and Entrepreneurship Program. Please join me now on giving a warm welcome to Scott Wilson and Jose Valentino. All right. Oh, that was a great introduction for Jose. And I have a couple other things to say about Jose really quickly. Um, I think Jose is one of the most important faculty members that I've seen here at the University of Florida since I was an undergraduate student. Great. His impact that he has brought has just absolutely transformed what we're doing. And uh, he brings all of these recording skills. He teaches all of the recording software. His students have to make commercials. They have to put the music to the background of a little movie section. And all of our kids have now developed the skill of being able to record themselves and have home studios. And it has transformed everything that we do. Now we can do asynchronous recordings. He's also the engineer behind those big band recordings that you see uh, where we're all asynchronously recording. <clears throat> and just as a, a player, I think Jose, if you haven't heard him play, is literally one of the finest jazz musicians in the world and a legend already in the making. The first time he came here for the audition, uh, he walked up and he just played the flute. He's the world's greatest jazz flute player. I promise you on that. Picked up the bass, played it like Victor Wooten from Bella Fleck. Picked up the saxophone, played all the John Coltrane tunes. And then he sat there and played piano and made up an impromptu rap during his, uh, during his audition for the job. And we were like, wow, this is something spectacular. He interfaces with all of the faculty on our School of Music, he's done the Sounds of the Season. If you watch that, that was Jose's production behind that, recording some of the sound uh, uh, with Wilson and Jacare Brazil with the jazz program. And he's just a spectacular, spectacular colleague. Please welcome Jose. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, uh, and I'm being recorded. I, I have to tell you, the true honor is mine. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Maybe, uh, maybe I can take uh, Don and Scott with me on the road, you know, or just to give me those virtual introductions. I think that's fantastic, you know. Uh, but I think I there, there's no way that I can uh, begin this thing without saying that you know Scott. Uh, actually, let me preface it with this. <clears throat> um, I can count the amount of mentors that I've had in my life. Some people are privileged to have 10, 15. I can count uh, the ones that I've had. And, and I, I counted yesterday and there were five. And Scott uh, has one of the fingers, not the middle one, but he has one of the fingers. <laughs> so that's my little joke for you guys. It, but it's also true as well. Uh, I thought about that joke right there. So uh, friends, it, it's a real honor. It's a real honor because you know, uh, those of you who have worked at the University of Florida School of Music, of course, even the University of Florida, I'm speaking on behalf of everybody, y'all contributed into, um, a, to, to the institution uh, to facilitate and pave way for a person like me to be able to uh, pick up the mantle and try to just add a drop of wonder in the students for which your legacy has contributed enormous, enormously. And, and so, you know, I thank you because I came to this job from another university and, you know, just the dynamic, the relationship of um, the, the collegiality of the faculty, just the standard of excellence that uh, you set 
for just the students and the institution and, and uh, I would say for the faculty um, is one that is so enjoyable because uh, I do feel an incredible uh, satisfaction with the challenge of even bettering myself continuously. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I got the job because I approach my career um, in one of service to fulfill the vocational aspirations and readiness of aspiring creative professionals in a post-COVID uh, creative arts economy. And um, y'all have done the same pre-COVID. And, and so I, I, I think, you know, while this is a first time introduction, um, I just want you to know that I do feel at home. And uh, I almost feel like that it would be more appropriate uh, for me to take the time and ask you all questions in terms of how I can um, navigate this, uh, you know, uh, amazing position that I'm in uh, to the best of my ability so that uh, everyone can win as opposed to uh, just maybe myself or as opposed to just only our students, but how can we just revolutionize um, even the vocation, the profession of what it is to be a music professor in today's age. And so um, maybe, maybe further conversation will manifest from this. And so... <clears throat> hey, uh, Jose, why don't you yeah. uh, tell them a little bit about what classes you're teaching and what you teach in that class now, because that's so different. And maybe some of the summer camps and guests that you've had and, and some of that, what that's going on. So they can kind of get that global picture of the new music building. Oh, sure, sure. Um, uh, yeah, let me see. I do have a presentation just in case, uh, in terms of kind of the gist of the direction in, uh, we, where we're going, uh, you know, what I'm kind of contributing, um, to the school of music. And I also have, you know, examples of students works and things like that, but we're teaching a class. Um, maybe I should, I should share my screen, huh? Let's see. All right. Second. All right, cool. I'm going to share my screen with you all. So welcome to my world of Canvas courses. <laughs> all right. So uh, currently uh, this semester, I'm teaching a course called Foundations of Music Business, Introduction to Music Technology, Social Impact of Music and Entrepreneurs. Um, I'm also teaching in other semesters a course called Strategic Music Entrepreneurship Development. And I've created some new courses that are yet to be taught. Uh, I revamped a course that Scott created called Music Production and Commercial Media. And I created another one called Multimedia Production for the Music Industry. But uh, just so you can have a gist of how we are preparing um, our students. Um, let me see, I'll, I'll, I'll even go to one of the previous courses. Uh, let's see, fall 2020. One of the great exciting things that we're doing is um, cross-listing these courses. And so, you know, this is such a newfangled area, at least within uh, music curriculum at a national scale, that I figured the way I can maximize my time and efficiency in reaching students from, um, you know, all levels and all departments of study is by cross-listing them. So each of these courses are, uh, consist of undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so all, in one sitting, I have undergraduate, masters, and doctoral students. And so uh, in this one course alone, within the first eight weeks, students are, uh, th these are the assignments that the students create, and I'll go through some of them just so you can kind of see how, what the relevancy uh, it has and how it prepares students for, uh, you know, to thrive in, in today's career. So I have an assignment called Establish the Pillars for Your Creative Enterprise, which essentially is the business plan. And I supplement all of my uh, lectures with pre-recorded uh, teaching videos and assignments and discussions and just really a lot of neat things, uh, resources so that students can really uh, maximize their understanding. I believe that understanding, I like to think of that word as the application of wisdom at the right time which is why um, I'm very much a project-based learning type of professor. And so a lot of these are projects. 
right? But they're projects that are customizable to the student's vocational interest. So among these, we have a unit that I teach, which is professional documents for creative professionals. So these are standard things that we all in the Zoom have done. For example, your resume, your cover letter, your CV. But instead of giving a general uh, guideline, what I like to do is to customize it based on the student's strengths and actually put an artistic spin to it so that, you know, it's, it's not the standard CV that, um, you know, has been used for jobs in all fields, but might include pictures and uh, whether it's a profile picture or action photos in work, in the action, if they're a performer, maybe have a, a, a nice photo in which Scott and I, we take photos of them in action and get uh, pictures of the audience engagement, the audience response. Um, and so then there's crowdfunding. So I teach them how to actually recruit funds and pitch ideas to be able to utilize social media um, to, to find those people that want to get involved in the projects of the, that students might have interest for, whether it's fundraising to develop their own nonprofit or um, fundraising to uh, get uh, travel, uh, you know, to, to, to get the travel expenses to be able to do a particular gig and teaching them how they can establish incentives so that uh, as they try to develop fan base in this digital space, ultimately, so that they can be experienced, uh, the, the fans can experience them in a physical realm, you know, in-person concert or teaching or workshop, whatever the case may be, uh, that there are incentives and that, that they can actually reach out to these people to become, not just to be fans, but to be called what I like to call super fans. And super fans, in short, is just um, the definition, at least the way I define it, is getting people so passionate about your work that they actually want to help scale your business. And so that's something that I've navigated in my uh, social media is I have people that comment, that like, you know, that support, that share my videos of my performances. And so I don't just uh, accept that and, and, and you know, as, as a way to, you know, self-glorify myself. That's not my aim. But my aim is to find people that will want to be a part of a team uh, that, that will do something greater because I believe I have this quote that's very simple, together we're stronger. And so I realized that the way I've had all these successes, of which some of them were noted um, in that biography um, that, was, uh, that was prefaced before this presentation, um, all of my successes have to, uh, were, were the result of an army. It's, it's sort of like that, the same, the saying, you know, it takes a village, right, to raise uh, a kid. It's the same thing. And so, you know, I'm also teaching them how to develop promotional resources, such as album covers, and these are the video tutorials, uh, how to engage in social media marketing, and also other principles that still apply today. Because not only do I have School of Music students, but I also have students from all the, across the university. So, because uh, as we know, the music business, there's the kind of forefront creative process, or the, the creative type of engagements that, um, in the music industry people do, you know, composing, performing, coming up with different musical products, producing all these different things. But then you, have, you still you need your lawyers, your business professionals, your public relations, all these different types of people. And so I give them the rubrics. And then um, the other course that I teach, for example, is social impact of music entrepreneurs. And these are sort of the assignments that I have. And uh, what, what I like about this is that that course uh, prepares students to be able to understand how to engage with nonprofit organizations that utilize music and the arts to, uh, uh, it, you know, music education and, and arts education to uh, interface with, let's say, at risk student populations in, in marginalized communities around the world, locally, all the way to internationally. And it teaches students how to advocate for the value that we understand music and the arts have and how to maximize the resources and so there's grant writing involved there's a lot of different unique things and then um with uh, the technology music technology courses that i teach i'm preparing students also to develop competencies uh, as media composers you know so that they know how to actually create the music to jingles for different companies for advertisements televised advertisements those types of things as well as how to create their original songs in all stages of the creative process, 
you know, um, where it's recording your instruments, how to arrange, um, how to develop improvisational skills and keyboard skills and theory skills and apply it to the kinds of music that they want to create so that essentially students are self-sufficient and don't need to rely on a record industry or record label to provide and to dictate to them what they want to do. And so now um, there's been a strong emphasis on uh, that in my teaching on how to uh, navigate a post COVID world in which, you know, I believe there's just so much opportunity, but uh, you know, part of what I'm really trying to do is ultimately get the students to really think of, think of themselves as solutionists, not just to somebody who wants to accept a job opening, but to create a job and how to develop the courage to be able to pitch um, a role to a company or a partnership uh, to make that company or to just ultimately make a community better. So there's a lot of emphasis on how they can use their platform as musicians, as uh, uh, strategists, as business professionals, as, as legal representatives to make greater impact through musical arts uh, and, and to interface with uh, non-music aspects of, of, you know, uh, of a county or on a state level or a national level, ultimately to ameliorate and, uh, you know, and improve um, society as a whole, you know, make the world a better place in a nutshell. Hey, and I also wanted to say, when, when these people come out of Jose's classes, <clears throat> they are glowing over the moon. Our students have wanted this information for so long. And also to his credit, uh, there was a lot of pushback. Are, are these students going to be able to do this? Are they going to be able to become and able to make their own commercials, play in all the instruments and do that? Um, they didn't think they would actually have the time or be able, but Jose is such a efficient, fantastic teacher and one of the greatest engineers I've ever seen. I've seen him go, let's write a song, sit down at the logic board, play all the parts, bass, piano, drums, come up with a tune in 40 minutes and have a track as if it, we've been working on it for six months. And he teaches those skills about how, this is how you do it. This is how you EQ a microphone. This is how you compress you know, a track to make it sound good. And our students are literally eating it up. Everybody wants to take his classes and it's a huge big shift with, with the School of Music. So hats off to you, Jose. I appreciate it. Here's a quick uh, glimpse of one of my syllabi of the course, one of the courses I'm teaching right now, Foundations of Music Business. So you can see here how I've organized the units of study, uh, you know, legalities of the music business. So understanding copyright, license, distribution, streaming, music publishing, performing rights organizations, the influence of technological advancements for new music genres. And that particular thing is, is focused on how do we introduce new art, new to, you know, uh, create different genres that could eventually be marketed and expand the uh, consumer interest of, of just music. Um, understanding the difference between record labels, independent versus uh, a major, and which one is gonna be more appropriate for the student's interest. So while a lot of universities um, cover these topics in a general understanding, what I try to do is to make it applicable for each and every student. And that same goes, uh, holds true for the other class of music entrepreneurship, because um, <clears throat> this is business. And so this is to prepare them to, to function in the corporate world. Entrepreneurship is focused on creating their own company, but um, even their websites, like I don't ever want somebody to be a carbon copy of myself. And so we tailor it and then we put it to the test, which is really amazing. Some of the students, uh, you know, come prepared with, with uh, representative examples of uh, that, that are demonstrative of, of the skills that they bring to the table professionally. You know, they have their videos, they have songs. And so we put it to the test and, you know, get, land them endorsement deals and um, get them to start doing clinician work and different things like that. It's a lot of fascinating things that the, uh, that's happening right now. And I think part of it is because my um, teaching philosophy is that uh, I don't see them, I don't treat them as two students. I, I do see them as students, but I don't treat them as such. And I think Scott does the exact same way. We treat them as professionals and we expect them to take this work seriously. I tell my students, I never want to give them an assignment that is just busy work. And all of these translate into assignments that is actually uh, going to be directly beneficial, not just for themselves, but also for functioning and thriving, even landing a job in the corporate music industry uh, sector. 
Uh, I'll, I'll show you one assignment that I absolutely love that the students are getting to do right here. This is called a multi-level competitor analysis. Now, the fact that I even said that in a school, in, you know, in front of School of Music faculty <laughs> should be an indicator of the direction that we have, where we have arrived, you know, we have arrived. And so we have the multi-level competitor analysis. So look at this, look what I tell them. It's a, it's a six step process. So based on aspired vocation of interest, their aspired vocation of interest, and I tell them, you know, I know you have several, but just pick one for the assignment, engage in the following steps. And then next week, they're going to do a PDF presentation uh, and share with the class or two weeks from now. So look, they provide a description of their music business vocation. Then they have to indicate who are the five competitors, pick five competitors for their particular skill set, uh, business or, 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 you know, even if they're a performer, okay, who's their competition at a local level? Who's their competition at a state level? Who do they really need to be thinking about? Who is the, at the bar? Who's raising the bar at a regional level, at a national level, an international competitor? And so for each competitor, they have to summarize the following things, seven things. Their aims for each one. What are their aims? Their, their impetus for what they do. Research, they have to investigate. Investigate those artists' website, those company website. What are the various products and services that they provide? Do they teach? Do they teach and perform? Do they teach, perform, and produce? What is it that they do? What sets them apart? What's the longevity of, of their career? What's the chronological data of growth or decline in their respective area of their business? How about the demographic information of the employers or employees, if they have any? How about their other consumer? And do it a SWOT analysis. And then ultimately they have to do all this and then do one for themselves so that they can actually compare and describe the gains of their evaluation for their own personal business. And then based on the implications, they have to describe the implications of their findings to the other business professionals working within the company's focus. In essence, what I'm talking about here is, is that they get to do an assignment that is going to be formed in, in, in be put in presentation so that it's directly beneficial for them so that when they decide to apply for a job and go for the interview, they can actually join the conversation. They know what's out there. They can go there and not just talk about themselves, but they can talk about what exists and how we can be better. And th this is just one example of how I approached even this job to, to land my dream job here at the University of, Flo of Florida. So, you know, one secret to, 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 to everybody now that's being recorded is this is the kind of stuff that I did to prepare uh, for, for the job and perhaps a, a, t a trick for why I landed it is because I, I understood what the competition is. I understood that there were other candidates for, the, for my position that were highly competent. So I needed to find a way not to make myself look like the best. I don't believe in that. But what I believe is to, to create a distinct package that is going to complement multiple sectors of this meta um, culture that you, the School of Music uh, at UF faculty, uh, Professor Emeritus, have established, have created for me. You know, that's one of the things is I've applied to other jobs and, and I've noticed other places um, I could have done the job well, but the culture might not have been a fit. And at UF, it is a fit, which I really love because we like to win and we like to be the best. And we also like to, uh, we like to be cross-generational in our pedagogical uh, outreach and also in our pragmatic um, influence in society. What I mean by that is, you know, we're not afraid of, of the new stuff. I, we are also very cross-cultural in, 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 in not limited to ethnic culture, you know, it's, of course, we take, we, we love embracing um, cultural expressions from different parts of the world. We have the ethnomusicology department, things like that. But I'm talking about just, uh, you know, even belief systems, uh, uh, ways of life, you know, philosophical underpinnings for how we approach life and let that inform our creative and entrepreneurial processes as music makers. We are not just cross-cultural, cross-generational, but we're also cross-genre. In mean, meaning that we intersect. We're not just professors. We are performers. We are administrators. We are um, doing professional service and literally expanding the field. And this is what we're preparing the students to think like how to be polymaths, you know, which is the fancy word for a Renaissance person, if you will, you know. And lastly, we, we are also cross communicative 
meaning we're not afraid to communicate to people in a variety of means. We're not afraid to learn and say, you know what? We're gonna learn Zoom. <laughs> Even if it wasn't my generation where we did Zoom, we're learning Zoom. We're gonna learn how to use these social media apps. We're gonna learn how to, you know, communicate in different ways in person, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I think um, uh, there's just a lot of really exciting things that are happening and uh, just very excited about uh, what the students are doing. And, and you know, right now we're, we're at a level where um, it's getting to a level where the students are inspiring me so much that they're the ones who are eventually going to be teaching me. And that's the greatest joy, I think, of, of a professor. So That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, and it's, it's ironic. Some of our, you know, jazz minors and stuff are graduating and stuff. They're, ha you know, they got these skills and all of them. And and now they're actually, you know, as University of Florida people do, they have other degrees. They have degrees in engineering, aerospace, um, all that stuff. And we're seeing them actually get win big jobs and hire our other students, hire other faculty. <clears throat> a great example is Zach Chester just got hired as a programmer. Um, he, he was our jazz faculty keyboardist. He got his grad degree here. And one of our former jazz miners just this semester landed a big gig and hired him as the developer for their company because he has all of these web software skills, which he developed in our classes, uh, which was really cool. But man, I love to see all this. Jose, it's just amazing you're getting all of this information to the to the people. Does anybody have any questions for Jose uh, on that little particular segment? Looking at the gallery. Hey, bud. Hi. Um, do you create a textbook or a syllabus that covers the material that you're teaching uh, in these courses? Oh yeah, for every single one. They, I have, I have uh, all the resources and syllabi for them. Yep. Uh, how, how many of you guys? would like to hear Jose play a little flute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Lord. Right. How about this? Um, you know, it, it's interesting, right? Because, um, <clears throat> it, you know, my, uh, it, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about versatility and just not being put in a particular box. You know, I will, speaking of flute, I, I will get to it. I will segue this. Um, you know, I started as a, as a flute player and I still am. You know, I, I, I actually studied for 21 years. At eight years old, I studied with the flute professor at the University of South Florida, who's my neighbor. I see her as my aunt. She's now a professor emeritus of flute. And, uh, and, I, and I love her. Her name is Dr. Kim McCormick. And she's like my aunt, you know. And, and uh, you know, I, I, the, the, the flute community certainly knows me because of just my involvement with her and then things that I've done with other flute players, uh, Jim Walker and things like that. And, Recently, I, I'm a, a contributing author for uh, a book that just came out, uh, published by Presser. Um, and this is what I call my, I, I call this my, my, uh, my nerd side of me, meaning like this has nothing to do, this is my nerd passion. Because like, while I don't teach flute, um, it, you know, at the University of Florida, you know, everybody understands my my passion for it. It's like my other side hobby. And so this is the new book. And there I am in the center right next to the professor of flute at Juilliard and James, Gal uh, James Galway. And, and it's 66 uh, flutists from around the world, Ian Anderson and the most traveled musician in the world, Viviana Guzman, and, you know, just different people here. And it's cool. I made it into the cover and, and uh, I represented UF and it's providing uh, performance tips for how to alleviate performance anxiety. And in my particular case, you know, since I'm very passionate about how to scale an opportunity, which is a facet of music business and entrepreneurship, I discussed uh, in that, you know, not only how to prepare, but how to really think conscientious about the audience and how to scale um, the performance so that we can actually gain video footage of the performance and repurpose it to get more opportunities, right? And so uh, I am a flute player and, you know, I have two Grammy Awards uh, in, in, in which I played flute this year and last year. <laughs> and so, yeah, Scott is right. I, I mean, I, I intersect with the jazz department, but I just, I love music so much. You know, I, I love playing pop music. I love playing all kinds of things. And Scott and I, we're, we're cut from the same cloth because he's a incredible 
you know, um, show producer and, and was a former director of Universal Studios in Japan and has a lot of different things, you know, break dancer, all kinds of different things. And in the same way, it's like, you know, I, I, I think what the answer for me in order to, to kind of uh, comprehend why is it that I vacillate so much in terms of my passion for musical genres is that I love people more than I love music. And the ability to connect with people, uh, the opportunity to do so is, gives me the fuel to practice and to expand my musical expressivity so that I can ultimately connect with people from different walks of life. And um, so I'd love to share with you um, my, uh, my latest classical contemporary composition, and that's what I won the Grammy for. Uh, and uh, it, it features me on flute, okay? And uh, the secret is, now that I've won, now that I won, I can actually make this disclaimer and y'all can be the first to know. My family knows this. Are y'all ready? Uh, I actually improvised my flute part from beginning to end. And then with the recording technology, so you understand the power of it, the recording technology, it, we took it and then my pianist um, decided to record and perform the piano in different sections and add it, kind of piece it together. Then we notated it all. And then we mixed, mastered it, and just made this product. But then I, uh, uh, I, and I got um, some noted prof notable professors, including our head of composition, uh, Paul Richards, who was kind enough to do a nice write-up, and I included it in a press release, and then I marketed it everywhere. And so while that doesn't guarantee you a Grammy, that, what that does is it gets, brings a lot of attention um, for people to say, you know what, I need to at least check this out because not only the testimonies were included, but there was an impetus for why I decided to create this composition through what I like to call comprovisation. Okay. And what, here's a fascinating thing for all of us professors. Um, it was the first time in a very, very long time in the Chronicle Higher Education that they premiered an artistic article. Usually all these things have to do with politics and bureaucracy and things like that. And at, they, they added a footnote and they said, University of Florida professor, music business professor, nominated for Latin Grammy for a composition that deals with, um, you, you know, promoting um, dialogue uh, among uh, different people groups in today's world, you know, and, and it was like, you see, so there's, there, there's ways to scale that, but I ultimately, I need to be who I am. And first and foremost, I am a flutist. And, and so my career and my desire to want to connect with people from a performance standpoint um, is what has paved way for me to really understand the value of music business and entrepreneurship. And with that said, let's go ahead and um, show you the composition. I'm going to share my sound real quick. And here it is.
So there you go. <laughs> awesome. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. So yeah, just keep in mind, uh, it, it won the the uh, the Grammy Award for Best Classical Contemporary Composition, and the secret was that I used jazz to help me improvise this, uh, the, you know, in this tradition. But I mean, I, I grew up with a flute professor who was just amazing with contemporary classical pieces, and so uh, I had that sort of instilled in me, you know, innately. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, if you go to Jose Valentino is my artist name, my first and middle name on YouTube, Jose Valentino, that's J-O-S-E, and then like Valentine, but with an O, you'll find a lot of videos of me doing different things. And, you know, um, it's one of the ways that I can just satisfy and, and kind of keep myself sane, right? Just release all these different musical ideas. And so, are there any questions or anything that uh, you'd like me to do or demonstrate or? If yeah, I'm not sure if that was me. I, I do have my alto flute with me, so. <laughs> yeah, play. I think, you know, one of the things about Jose is seeing is believing. You know, I'm always not just attracted to a, a player, but a performer, someone who just absolutely captures the stage. And the way Jose does performances, and you, you guys can come hear us. We're going to send you the poster here when we have it done. But we actually have next Monday... And every Monday, six to nine, we were telling you that we're playing down at the Keys Piano Bar, where you can come see Jose. Yeah. It's and, amazing. Please come out. I would love to see you in fellowship, you know, and we'll wear our masks and, and things like that. And come out, because, I mean, there's so much music that I want to share with, and I'd love to just fellowship with you all. Well, and, why don't you uh, noodle on? I, I, I noodle <laughs> on. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see. I'm totally not warmed up, but uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Maybe I have my... I have a lot of different instruments uh, there. There's my bass guitars. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, I'm warmed up now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do a song that I really like. Uh, so, we all know Frank Sinatra, but I want to introduce you to the Frank Sinatra of Cuba. And while I'm Puerto Rican, which is like, we like to say we are two wings of the same bird. Uh, we have our culture, but there's a lot of, you know, cross pollination for sure, because we're so close to each other. Um, we, there was a, a, a singer who was the Frank Sinatra of Latin America who played boleros, which is like ballads. You know, it's, it's the, I like to think of, when I performed with Paquito de Rivera um, at Carnegie Hall, he said, boleros are like ballads with rice and beans. And so anyways, this song is called Como Fue. And I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play the melody um, and then I'm gonna improvise uh, outlining the harmonic structure and try to give you a feel for the type of rhythm for the bolero. So I'm gonna do a little intro before I do the melody. Thank you. 
<laughs> you make it look so easy, Jose. It just flows right off your fingertips and just endless ideas and creativity. And it's just, just amazing the way you, you play that. And, oh, oh gosh, wait till you see him play bass and sing. That's that's just a whole a whole nother aspect. But oh, thank you for playing for us. Oh, thank you for having me, everybody. It's good to just kind of introduce, um, you know, a little bit of my world. And uh, if if you does anybody keep up with the school of music happenings? Uh, the school of music happenings. Uh, maybe I'll give it to Scott. Scott could forward you a link uh, next Wednesday. Um, if it's not too late for you, you know, it starts at 730, but it'll be via Zoom and you can actually see the students works, you know, their music production and film scores and, and you know, just check it out. It'll be yeah. a really fun time. One of the cool things he does is he does a student showcase for his class. So at the towards the end of the semester, they get to present their little commercials their movie projects and then everybody watches together and it's on Zoom. You can actually watch and see what's going on. You'll be blown away by what these students are doing with their first class in his area and how much just he gets them from A to Z so fast. But uh, yeah, send us that link. We'll send it over to these people. Sure, absolutely. All right. Hey, do you want to just hey, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. No. Made a question? I, I couldn't even show you um, the most recent film score that uh, my students and I did collectively for a professional company and they got credit. and. Now it's in the running for a, a major branding competition, if you want to hear it. Yeah. All right. He and his did this together. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm going to show you. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. Hold on one second. Just give me about 10 seconds. A slow 10 seconds. So more like 20. Hold on. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that he galvanizes his students, like, I, what I've seen already is, and we've been on some professional projects with other Grammy artists and stuff, and he brings his students in, like, for their first opportunity to be on one of these records that's being, you know, possibly mm -hmm. nominated for a Grammy, a commercial or something like that. And uh, he's working with a lot of different talented artists across the university that aren't per se School of Music people, but they have this production value and they have this uh, business of them singing or they have whatever. And, and gets them on his different various projects so that they can actually have something to launch their careers. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Scott. And, you know, I mean, I just, uh, we, we become teachers because we, we love to help. We want people to succeed and thrive in, in their calling. It's, it's um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's in many ways, one of the most selfless professions and, um, you know, I mean, in, in a very hostile world that we live in today, where it's like everybody is like a hyena looking after themselves and for their own benefit, it, it's almost contradictory to to be a caring professor. But I think that's one of the things that we have done so well. And what, uh, one of the reasons why I love staying and working here at UF, because I noticed that the, the professors truly care. And uh, much credit to the, the, the uh, dynamic that y'all have uh, facilitated. And so <clears throat> anyways, this is the audio of a commercial uh, in, you know, just to give you an idea of, of what it sounds like. Hold on. Camera cut. The sun is setting on the old way of doing things. What if the future of production was something like this? Where set life is a beach, where there's an endless sea of possibilities. What? Camera cuts. To TV. In what way? Losing light. It feels contrived. Be you. Okay, so just uh, now I'm just going to show you the music because uh, this is the audio and then there's already the commercials already out. But what it is, it's it's a promotional video for an actual media company. So it's it's interesting, right? Because media companies make promotional videos, but that media company needs to get business. And so they're a very uh, internationally known. They've, this is the same company that makes the music videos for a thing on YouTube called Kids Bop. Um, that, that, you know, brings a lot of money. And so the CEO of the company happens to be my, uh, was my neighbor across the street. We grew up together. And so uh, I built that relationship. And so, you know, I've done a lot of commercials for different uh, advertising companies like Coca-Cola, Swiffer, Adidas, you name it. And, you know, we've done it. And so anyways, this is the audio of a two-minute promotional video of the company doing 
uh, and, and kind of making a little humor thing about it. You know, they're like, oh, we're trying to make this uh, commercial, but we can't even do it for ourselves. You know, and so that's sort of the gist of it all. But he said, uh, he said, I, I need the music to be continuous, which means uh, in his case, we did a spotting session for continuous for him. What that means is within the same key. And I teach the kids that. And so I, I actually showed them the email exchange between the, the director and I. And um, then uh, he said, there's six scenes in this two minute promotional video. Uh, because one of the things about the technology today with this company is that they can literally be working on the shooting the same commercial, but you might have the director in LA, you might have a video editor in Japan, you have one in London, and you have one in, uh, you know, the western part of uh, Colorado, and then you have one in Florida and one in New York. And so those are the different points in which they're actually working in real time. And so it's a promotional video to kind of showcase that. And uh, he said, I need a different jingle for the different each setting in which we are working from. And so the first one is the director is uh, uh, saying, he's saying uh, he's in Florida, he's, he's doing his role. And so he said, I need something beachy. And so I told the students, I said, hey, can you all help me create something beachy? Of course I can create a lot of beachy music. And what is beachy, right? I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. So, you know, beachy for me is salsa, boom, ba, chicka, beep, beep, ba, chicka, boom, 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 bang, boom, bang, bang, boom, bang, right? But if you go to the Bahamas, Beachy is another kind of music. You go to Jamaica, it's a different kind of thing. And so he said, no, you know, just kind of like when you go to Bahama Breeze. I said, Bahama Breeze, you mean the restaurant here in Florida? I said, all right. And so I thought, all right, you know, let's just kind of check it out. And so these are the instruments that were recorded on the MIDI keyboard. Do you have your steel drums? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, steel drums. And then I said, you know, let me mix a little Afro-Cuban uh, upright piano, the sound of, not, not the actual playing, but the sound of an Afro-Cuban upright piano. Then the bass. And I teach these kids, and so these kids help me actually create this. That's the drum set. There you go. And now they're going to go to New York. Okay, so uh, the, the media production company are saying, ah, oh, that was so cheesy to the CEO, he said, no, you, you, you need to be a little bit more relaxed. Let's go ahead and dim the lights a little bit for this trailer that we're making for our company. And then uh, it's got this New York scene. And so I, you know, he said, I need something jazzy because it's New York. I said, jazzy, you know what jazzy means? Jazzy could be as wide as Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong to Coltrane to Scott Wilson. Yes, I put Scott Wilson in the mix because he's the best, but, um, so then I said, all right. So I, I took my little keyboard and I started playing the drums here. And then I did my bass right there. And, I, and the students were putting the pianos and drums. And, you know, this is what we came up with. And then we slowed down the tempo. So this is the tempo uh, indicator right here. We can slow it down. So it, it eventually went to uh, this tempo right here, uh, 72, okay? Um, then what was next? I think the next one was the, the kind of country western. So the students and I, we, we did some live recording as well. And we came up with this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, and that's me whistling. You know, that's that's the uh, that's the Grammy Award winning whistler right there. <laughs> Terrible whistler. So you'll notice that the bluegrass, like I'm teaching them keyboard. They, they're, what we're doing is in my class, I like for them to. I find value in the theory and the keyboard skills that they do. And so, you know, I tell them, this is the time for you to really exercise this stuff. So I have them watch YouTube videos of different styles of music and actually analyze what are the musical things happening. So, you know, we saw a bluegrass video of a banjo player and banjo tutorial. And what we noticed is, okay, uh, they, it's arpeggiated, but there's one consistent note that is played throughout all of the different harmonic changes. So I said, okay, so how do we apply that into the actual keyboard? Well, and so we're teaching different kind of 
you know, keyboard skills that's not normally done for, you know, when playing uh, Rachmaninoff, but still valuable, you know? And, uh, and I'm so happy that our uh, director of the School of Music, Kevin Orr, understands he too can navigate logic and understands the value of this kind of thing. Then they said, hey, can you give us a little bit of LA uh, vibe, like Hollywood music? I said, Hollywood music? Like, and that's the thing about directors is that, you know, they, they give you the descriptors, but you have to understand, you have to do what's called a spotting session. So I teach these kids how to do the spotting session, and then we come up with the music. So we, um, before I show you what we um, ended up with, uh, I, I said, he said, you know, something with like a symphony orchestra. And I said, it's symphony orchestra. Wow, okay. This is a scene where uh, one of the video directors is in his backyard. Do you want a full blown symphony orchestra? I said, okay, well, here you go. I'll isolate. And he says, no, no, that's a little bit too epic. And, and truthfully, actually, you'll notice that there's no tracks here, but you'll notice here on the side, it says snare, bass drum, cymbal, you know, bassoons, all these horns and things. I actually made it much more epic. I, I did a full blown symphony uh, or, you know, a sym symphonic type of sound. He says, no, no, I need a little bit lighter, you know, just lighter. You know how violins play kind of light? And I said, oh yeah, I got you. And so we have uh, pizzicato. And so I said, all right, you know, let me, let me go ahead and do a little bit pizzicato. So um, I basically just played the chords with the pizzicato sound library that I have. Um, here you'll see, I have extra string ensemble pizzicato. And then I did this. And then here's the metronome to guide me. And then And then, you know, but that's happening during this audio. Okay, so check it out. This is the audio. This is the, the scene. Is this an interview now? What are you doing? Not an interview. I just uh, thinking maybe I could toss out some alt lines. That's all. Oh, sorry, it's my dog. Where are you? Oh, I'm in my backyard. You know. So that's the scene. And then we go to Japan because there's a video editor um, in Japan, uh, as well, working on this at the same time. So I did this, I took out my flute and I did something, uh, well, I did my C flute. This is the alto flute. It's a little lower. Uh, I'll just transpose it here. So I did something kind of like, And that's because I actually studied for a time with a shakuhachi player, so I can kind of emulate that sound. And I put a lot of reverb, and you cannot tell the difference. So check it out. I use this electric, this slumber type of spa pad because she actually works in an actual Zen garden. That's that's the, what was really cool. I could have gone any direction with Japanese music because they have so many amazing genres, but it was like I I have to go more traditional. And so uh, then. I couldn't find a koto, so what I did is I, choose, I chose something that sounded similar, and this is what I came up with. All right, and then it transitions to London, and so London, you know, has has a lot of different music, but. Uh, this guy, I noticed uh, he's working in a really high apartment with like the city and things like that. So I said, all right, we're going to do a genre of like electric dance music from London, which is called Garage, uh, which is, I think just means garage, because I think it came from, it was kind of developed. It was like a subculture of garage making music in London in the 2000s. So uh, this is it right here. And this is very common kind of stuff that we've heard before. So uh, here we go. Early tomorrow, um, I think we've got what we needed. All right. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. 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 Cheers, everybody.
Well done. Yeah. And then, um, you know, he said, I need a jingle. And he knows this much music theory. He said, I, I have the words and I have the notes. He said, uh, need a crew, need it live. Call your friends at Hayden Five. Hayden Five is the company. This is the two minute promotional video. And he wrote, need a crew, C. Need it live, E. Call your friends at G, Hayden Five, high C. So that was his music theory. He says, I know that I know how to do a C major chord. Can you sing that for me? And then I said, sure. <laughs> That's it, and that's the jingle. And then you have the credits for that uh, promotional video for the company. And so, you know, um, it, 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 it's great because it was something that was like a professional opportunity for me, but what I did is I just made it accessible for all the students so that it became a collective, larger collective, so. Well, thanks thank for <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Jose, for giving us a little insight on your life and some of the producing. And again, you, you have done jingles and stuff. I, I was reading on your website for like Nike, Adidas, like Coca-Cola, the, the major. He also produced um, for, was it X Factor and American Idol? Yeah. His producers on those sessions, uh, which is really, really cool. And uh, before we close out, uh, can I open it up to uh, any questions uh, from the audience that you'd like to know? What was it like producing on X Factor or American Idol or, you know, any other, any kind of questions that you would like to hear uh, from Jose? Anything. Dale, go ahead. I know you've been eager to say something. <laughs> it's really not a question, but I want to tell Jose last night that I listened to Time to Wake Up. I listened to that about two or three times. It was so beautiful. And oh, I'm thank you. That you're not a, a professor or a teacher, too, because, I mean, you're a genius. Everything I heard last night on uh, YouTube, it was so good. Oh, I, I really pre appreciate it. And, you know, um, everybody has uh, th their, their calling, you know, at, at different times. And so I'm just here to make myself available for the students. And, you know, I mean, uh, if students want to learn anything that I'm capable of teaching, then I certainly extend that time, especially during office hours. And, you know, um, uh, so, yeah, I really appreciate that. It was great. Jeffrey? Yeah. I'm sorry, Dale, did you want to finish? I want to tell him, I listened to several other uh, musics that on um, YouTube last night. And I listened to one, and I really fell in love with Time to Wake Up. And then I listened to another and another and another. And I just wanted to say, I mean, I was drawn in. Oh, appreciate it. Here, let, let me let me put a, just a real quick clip so that people can see this in context. And by the way, this is a representative example of the kind of stuff that you can hear on Monday, uh, you know, uh, with Scott and I, with our band, which I think our band sounds a little bit better than this, but check this out. This was live recorded, live performance recording in the studio. Uh, yeah. So no editing, no filters. And here we go.
wondering, that's not my twin brother. That is me. What we did is we recorded the rhythm section first, and then I switched. And then I, I switched a uh, attire and then played my flute on top of it. So yeah, that's a little bit of time to wake up. <laughs> yeah. Jose on bass too, just killing it. Hey, Jack Martin, Jack Martin, go ahead and unmute. What's that? Jack Martin has a question. Uh, yes, I, I noticed in your lesson plans you had test interspersed as most professors do. I'm curious as to how you structure that test it seems like every lesson that you present is a test. Life is a test. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, to tell you the truth, this is how we go about it because there's a lot of different assignments. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so I, the way I do this is, um, <clears throat> since it's a lot of assignments and, and, and I teach each week the different subjects, but what I do is I, ha I give them the first five weeks to actually start working on this and to submit a draft by the end of the fifth week. And then what I do is I take the time, the remaining um, you know, three weeks to help advise them for how they can re revise each of those assignments and really tailor it and strengthen it for their particular vocational interest. So that by the time they submit it as, a, as their midterm on the eighth week, it's all perfect. And that's just sort of my uh, philosophy behind it because um, you know, I don't want to actually give them assignments and say, this week you got to do this, this week you have to do that. But, you know, th th we're talking about building careers, you know, and, and uh, because of that, it's important to, for me to also develop trust with my students at a level in which I can uh, be, uh, you know, have vulnerability in expressing how I really feel about their work and what they can actually do. But I say, you know what, these are your strengths. This is a these are the great directions that you could go. You might want to hold off on this dream for now because then if you solidify that it will eventually pave way for you to do this and so you know um i have to develop trust and so for that reason the 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 first batch of assignments are not due until uh the fifth week as a draft and then resubmitted three weeks later as uh, as their midterm and then the same thing happens for the second batch of assignments uh you know uh and, and that'll be due on week 15 and then uh, they do the final draft of all those amazing projects. They submitted it as their final project. So I, I just want, I want them to walk away with stuff that they can really say, you know what, I'm ready to rock it and I'm ready to do great work. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Maybe time for one, maybe two more. Anyone? Well, if not, then uh, all I can say is I can remember Jose and Scott when it was almost sacrilegious to say music and business in the same sentence. <laughs> so it's really exciting to see what you all are doing for our students. And I'm ready to come back to school myself if you'll accept an old guy like me. Come back. We want you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you so much, Jose and Scott. This has been a fantastic presentation. I know everyone will join me in, in saying thank you. All right. Thank and you all. It's been a great Wonderful. And next week, all you young guys in the audience here, it's going to be the swing era. So we'll see you at 10 o'clock next week. Thanks so much. Bye. See you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jose. I hope we all see right. you tonight. Hope we can see you on Monday, six to nine. Keys right, piano. We've got to, we'll work that out. We'll get a bus come from Old Camera. All right. All right. Awesome. Wonderful session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.